Welcome back, friends, to Build A Lot Acres. Today is a very special episode. It's our thousand subscriber special. We want to thank each and every one of you for subscribing, and for following along on our YouTube journey. We really, really appreciate it. And guess where we are today? We're at the Super Split Factory here in West Bridgewater, Massachusetts. So today's going to be a good one. We're going to be doing an interview and a tour with the owner, Paul. So please stay tuned. One small town New England family living out their adventures one day at a time, sharing for the whole world to see. This is Build A Lot Acres. Please remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed today's video. So we're here at the Super Split Factory with the owner, Paul McCann, and we're going to be doing an interview and just a quick chop tour and talk about the Super Split line. Great. So how's it going, Paul? Uh, going well. The uh, pandemic has been a blessing in a, in a way. You know, it's hard, but our sales have gone through the roof. Yeah. I'm not sure why. Combination of wood, people being home, but. Uh, it, it's been a blessing, but then again, we have the uh, challenges of the supply chain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every week you come in and wonder, uh, you know, what surprise you might get this week. Yeah. So we've been doing okay. Uh, ran out of uh, hoods at one point, and that was tough. So mm -hmm. one thing we're pretty good at here is uh, punting when something goes wrong. So my rule is we have to ship machines because mm -hmm. we're so darn busy. Yep. So we actually made some hoods out of cardboard. Oh wow. Shipped them, painted them red, put the stickers on them, and then shipped out, you know, when the new ones came in. Right. Engine went three months, well, not three, two months without an engine. So we're selling a lot of electric machines because we could get the electric motors. Or we'd ship machines and people would get their own motors. Uh, so it's, it's now, just been a real are most of the parts coming from the states or yeah everything comes from the states except for of course the motors uh, and small things like the bearings um, even our clutches come from the state but I think some of their components might come from overseas mm -hmm. you know you, you can't avoid that but as much as possible flywheels uh, of course all the steel tires tires come from overseas probably but they're built here so everything we can do yep. And we do most of it in house. Yeah, most of our own machining. And you have two two locations that you do your yeah, manufacturing. The, the original shop is in the uh, building across the parking lot, and that's where I work. Yeah, it's kind of the machine shop. And my son Connor is the one who uh, runs Super Split in house as far as assembly, shipping, parts, sales. So the more rough machining and building is done mm -hmm. over there, and then the final assembly kind of stuff is done here. Yeah, we have a powder coater who picks up the. Uh, Completed units over there, takes them to the shop, powder coats them, and then brings them over here. Yeah, so that's a, just having that delivery service is a real plus. Yeah, so it sounds like it's a family business. Mm -hmm. Maureen works in the office, my wife. Um, my other son, Tristan, works with me in the other shop, although he's probably not going to make a career out of it. It's not really his thing, but you know, he's doing real well. He just got out of college. Um, and we even have my daughter, Tessa, in here in the summers. So what's the kind of the early history? Your father kind of started it, or did he no, buy it from someone else? Yeah, he bought it from uh, Frank Grady, the original inventor. He was a machinist north of Boston. And uh, he bought it in 91, looking for a retirement business. He really just stumbled across it. He was looking at something else that Frank was selling. And he saw this and said, hmm, I'd like to sell that. So that's how we found it. Frank was only doing about 60 machines a year. He was a very clever machinist, and he was always inventing something. Yep. So he was off to his next. But he wasn't really business minded as far as sales and that kind of stuff. Yeah, he did his thing. I think he he always had his attention on the next thing down the road. Too. Is he still around? Yeah, I talked to him. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. He called me up about uh, two weeks ago. Wow. So he's got to be in his nineties. So when do you think he invented these originally? Like what year? About the late seventies. Late seventies, and you guys bought it in ninety one. Yes. Wow, so you've been doing it for quite a while though now, yeah. over 30 years. Yeah, I'd say. Have you been with your father since 91? Uh, pretty much, he was in a general contractor. Yeah. So I worked for him for a while, and then I went on my own in steel erecting when I was 28. And uh, did that till, well, my dad had to retire uh, in 91. I'm sorry, not 91, uh, 
97. So that's when I took it over. All right. And uh, about seven years or so, I get out of the construction business completely. And by then, this business, you know, starting at 60 machines a year when we got it, and we did, uh, we cracked 400 a couple of years ago. Wow. So every year, it's uh, just been increasing a few percent every year without yeah. any effort. We stopped advertising probably uh, at least 25 years ago. Yeah, it's all word of mouth and YouTube. Yeah, I'm on several forums and you guys never have, no one ever has a bad thing to say about the super splits. Yeah, it's always positive from the, you know, how rugged and reliable the machines are to the customer service. I think a lot of people are surprised when they call and you actually answer the phone and they find out you're the owner. Mm -hmm. You know, versus a bigger company, you might call and get someone to get someone else to get someone else, or you might get a computer yeah. message or so yeah, I think people that. like that kind of service. I learned something from a uh, uh, alpha called Focus on the Family. Uh, his rule is the phone gets answered in three rings yeah. all the time. So yeah. we try to do that. Uh, we only have one line though, so a lot of times it's busy. Mm. Yeah, I know I've called a few times and it's always been very helpful. You guys are right there. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you mind if we take a look and go through some of the cool. models and the features? And yep. <clears throat> now, I know you were saying earlier that uh, just shipped out a bunch of stuff, but normally you'd have more machines in here. Yeah, usually these three stands would be full on this side, and there's three more on the other side. So right now, this is the only machine we have. This is waiting for a pickup. Mm -hmm. So what what model machine is this? This is the heavy duty. All right. Uh, what differentiates that between the J model? J model is made the same way it was made 30 years ago. Uh, and that has 75 pound flywheels. Yeah, those are the ones behind me there. And the J model, I mean, the HD had what, 90s? 90. Uh, and we made that change. Frank uh, had the heavy duty in the J. It was basically the same machine with uh, some extra bearings on the cam lock, a bigger motor, yep. a couple other bells and whistles. Didn't cut, the price difference wasn't as much, but the performance was identical because it had the same flywheel. So it took us a little while, but we decided to make these 90s. And that was in what, 2012 or so? I can't remember, but yeah, it would have been about 10 years. So if you have an HD before 2012 or so, it would have been the, pretty much the same as a J. Yeah, you can tell by the thickness. It's yeah. a two and an eighth for a, for a 90 pounder and an inch and seven eighths uh, flywheel for the uh, 75 pound J model. Now, what's the next model after the HD? Special edition. Yep. Um, that has 100 pound flywheels and has a nine horse Honda with a two to one gear reduction. Oh, this wow. is a GX200, which is equal to a 6.5. Uh, the nine horse with the uh, two to one gear reduction on it, that was made for all the big elms that were coming down in the 70s mm -hmm. and 80s because the 75 pound machine just didn't have enough oomph for uh, you know, some of those really tougher woods. Yeah. There were a lot of big elms coming down. Mm -hmm. So the 100 pound flywheels gave you, give you a lot more impact force, and then the nine horse will actually uh, kind of muscle in and keep it going even if the flywheels tend to want to slow down. Most of these machines, you know, the drain the heavy duty, once the flywheels start to slow down on a really tough piece of wood, uh, it loses its momentum and its advantage, so it's just gonna stall, which is, uh, you know, gives the wood round one. And tap the handle down. Give it another shot. So here's slow motion speed. You have a valve spring here that is always trying to lift this rack up. Pivots right on that pin. And then you have the return spring on each side that is always trying to pull the rack back. They have a bevel here on the end of this rack here. Mm -hmm. As soon as that bevel rolls under the bearings on the cam lock mechanism that lock it into the pinion, Springs do their thing. This spring lifts it up, the other spring pulls it back. So at any time during the cycle, sometimes the wood might shift on here, or you think it's a really tough log and it might stall the flywheel. I'll let it go on about halfway or so. And I'll it the yeah, I know I've, I've had people ask, does it stop mid-cycle? I think people are worried once you engage it, it's going to go all the way. Yeah. But it does stop once you hit down on it. Whether it's all the way or halfway or... I mean, the hardest thing this machine does is stop itself. That's what's testing the gears and that and the mechanism. Now, as far, I know you said the flywheel weight and the engines can be different, but are there any differences as far as the rack system or yep. tolerances? 
Well, the difference is uh, every time you buy a batch of I beams, you wonder what you're going to get. Yeah. Yeah. We've we've actually had, uh, especially lately, we had uh, trouble even finding them. Well, you know, I caught like four or five suppliers, and uh, they're out there, but they're having delays in, in receiving material. So uh, we got this batch, and they are like this. That's an exaggeration. Top flange is like this, and the right. bottom flange is like that. So, so that requires a lot more machining, and actually welding the plates on the bottom so the machine sits square. But if we didn't do that, it would be standing there tilted. Right. You know, you just never know what you're going to get. Width can vary. So we machine them so the sides are parallel, but we don't have a specific uh, dimension. And back in the day, when Frank first started doing this, of course, we didn't have CNC machining. So he would just, again, get them, if there was any curve or anything in it, he'd have a, he had a grinder set up that would do it. The holes on the side guides are off center. Mm -hmm. So you can put them on like that or like that in any combination, and it'll accommodate just about any size with I-beam that we come across. Now as far, so the I-beams, it sounds like are the same, whether you get a, a J model or HD or SE, right. but the wedges, do those change? Uh, the special edition wedge used to change. It had a, a, a different backup piece and we did some experimenting with it and we uh, have gone to just the same wedge for all the machines and have had no repercussions with the special edition. I think he just did that out of an abundance of caution. Uh, but because of the way we do the table now, that piece, you know, we couldn't make a uh, change to the production right. tray that we uh, had in the past. Yep. And the rack, are those the same model to model too? Uh, two inch racks on the J and the early heavy duties, two and a quarter on the special edition. So when we started the 90 pound heavy duties, uh, first couple of them had the two inch racks on it. Never had an issue with them, but we decided to go with the two and a quarter. Mm -hmm. That way we could purchase the two and a quarter racks in bulk as opposed to uh, with the special edition. You know, we didn't sell as many of them. Right. They're really overkill. Yeah, I know. That's one of the, uh, I think that seems to be one of the issues a lot of your copycat competitors had was the racks were breaking off teeth. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And there's a number of reasons. One, the racks may not be, you know, the same quality as ours. I'm not sure of that, but I think a lot of it has to do with our engagement mechanism. Mm -hmm. If that isn't locked on tight and stays consistent, then, uh, you know, the teeth are at risk. Yeah, you guys are doing it a long time. Mm -hmm. When did, speaking of all that, when did the copycat companies really start coming out? Was it when the patent ran out or? No, no, it took quite a while. Uh, there's been a number of them, but it was probably almost 10 years once the patent ran out. But without advertising, very few people knew we were even out there. So yeah, it was word of mouth. So when all, they, all those copycat companies came out, kind of helped you in sales, because it familiarized people with kinetics in general, or? Uh, it's hard to say, because our growth has been pretty steady, you know, right. like 5% a year, right. every year, it, it, you know, I didn't notice a huge jump, and I think uh, might even have lost sales, you know, that we would have grown quicker, hard to tell you, but yeah. they, all those companies advertised. A lot of them went out of business, too. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't want to get into names, but, I think we both know. Well, yeah. I've used that in my, you know, when people are wondering, should I buy one of these or should I get that? Yeah. I said, well, we've been here 40 years, and I can tell you three companies yeah. that if they bought those machines, yeah. we can get calls from those people wondering if our parts will work on their machine. So, yeah. No, it's it's fortunate. Yeah. As far as the table, I know you offer a couple different choices, right? You have the standard production table, then the extra wide. Right. This is the standard? Mm hmm. Yeah, we made this change recently because the all the legs on this table go down. Yep. And we welded all the corners and then these side pieces bolt on. Our original table, th these legs went down and these legs went up. Yeah, mine, mine was the old style and it doesn't have the grab handle. That's a nice addition. But I've seen tables that are actually torn from here to here because that would be the weak spot. I mean, it just gives you an idea of the, some, the life that some of these have out there. Yeah, I've seen some that were... Uh, Pretty well used, for sure. Well, I got a couple in here that they want us to go over. You can take a uh, shot of them. <laughs> oh, nice. What some people do to them over the years. So you'll them. actually re kind of fix up old machines oh, and bring them back to life? Yeah, there's nothing you can do that we can't fix. One guy brought his in, uh, it was in a barn fire. So wow. it was just unrecognizable. But the frame is still fine, the flywheels are fine, well, you know, all the yeah. So we redid that. And another guy backed his skitter over his, he thought it was a stump. 
and he kept going. Yeah, so pretty much, you know, turn the horseshoe, uh, the axle into a horseshoe, uh, but nothing couldn't be fixed. Yeah. So you're asking about this pusher assembly. This is the heavy duty, and it pivots on that pin. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a new, I don't say new, in years, but my dad and brother-in-law came up with that. The original design just had one bearing on each side, and that was the pivot point. So when the rack pivoted to return, the space under the brass plate would open up maybe a sixteenth or so, and there was a right. slim chance of a splinter getting under there. So they came up with this method to keep the space tighter and just consistent back and forth because the pivot point is now on top of the I beam. Mm -hmm. uh, the wood doesn't know the difference. Mm -hmm. This is nice because you can take it out, put a vice grip on your I beam, pull the pin, and remo remove your rack without taking everything else apart. You don't really need to do that too often, but this little bearing under here, you've seen that online, that is the Achilles heel of the machine. Yeah. It rolls back on that. We changed it. We put a heavier cage and cut the top of the cage off so the bearing is more exposed and you can keep it clean with WD-40 as opposed to the original one had a little, the cage was tighter around a smaller bearing trying to protect it to keep the junk out. Mm -hmm. Of course that didn't work, the junk still gets in there. So this seems to be working a lot better as far as uh, keeping that thing rolling, but it's just something you have to keep an eye on. Yeah. That little bolt is greasable. Which I do if I'm going to store the machine for a while, but mm -hmm. during use, I just use something like PB Blast or WD-40 because mm -hmm. if you put grease on it, it just is like a dirt magnet. Yeah. I mean, we need to keep it clean. You have a little grease on the top of the rack and grease on the teeth, and that's about the only place you want to put grease. Now, if someone had an older SAJ model, could they upgrade to the heavier duty rack with their machine? Is that something that you do? Yes, you could do that. Uh, but again, the wood doesn't know the difference. Uh, you can still get a splinter. You know, there's a space under there occasionally, so I wouldn't go to the trouble myself. Uh, I've been doing this 40 years, and the J model, I just kind of figured out that you could pull this bolt here that holds the single bearing on each, each side, and then you can remove the rack without taking the whole thing apart. Mm. That's probably, you know, as long as I was doing it, that's how I was originally shot. I never figured that out until a couple of years ago. Yeah. Now, so, so you said you sell about 400 machines a year now. What percentage of those would you say are J models versus the HD or the SEs? Um, I would say it's more uh, 60, 70% heavy duty. Uh, so you sell more of those than the yeah. Js? Well, maybe, I, I don't even have the exact count, but it might be 50%. And then 40% J's and 10% special editions, somewhere in that range. Yeah, you give uh, someone a choice between regular and heavy duty, and they always want heavy duty. Is that what you would recommend for most people? No, I usually talk people out of special editions because you know, you just, unless you're splitting really tough stuff, yeah. uh, there's not much difference between a heavy duty and a special in impact force because there's only 10 pounds of difference in the flywheels. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so you're paying a lot for that nine horse Honda with the two to one gear reduction. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you're starting to slow, slow the flywheels down, then that'll kick in. And you know, the only wood that does that is something like Elm with a tough grain that's yeah. gonna fight you from the first inch to the last. Right. Most wood, once you're halfway through it, the fight's out of it. And so that's why these things work so well. Yeah, that's cool. Have you guys ever considered offering anything like a log lift or anything like that? Yeah, I got some ideas, but uh, you know, we can't put hydraulics on it, or, or we won't. Mm. <laughs> it just defeats the purpose of the kinetic splitter. So, uh, one of my copycats had a mechanical log lift, and I bought one of those. And it's just to me, it was more trouble than it was worth it, you know. Yeah, similar initial you guys have in the company name, right? <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, if you can't pick the thing up, I take uh, two steel wedges and a mall. Yeah, or well, you could noodle it with a saw. Uh, there's a YouTube video of a guy with an electric winch, uh, mm. but he's near 110 power. Mm. So uh, he, that works pretty good. And, yeah. And that's the idea I would like to do if I could somehow tap into the uh, energy in the flywheels mm. and power a winch. Could also do like an electric actuator underneath, but you'd have to have something to mount the brackets to. Mm -hmm. Well, that's off the post of the axle. Yeah. So that's kind of, I got a couple of yeah, things cool. that I unfortunately just don't have time to, to work on. Yeah, right I hear you. Works. Sounds like you're a busy guy. Yeah, employees have been uh, hard to come by. Mm. And 
but we've changed, uh, we're trying to automate more and more. We have yeah. a welding robot across the park a lot, and uh, uh, probably automate our CNC machines because uh, just get more done with, with what we got in the way of manpower. Mm -hmm. It's hard to keep help when you make one product and do one thing over and over and over again. Yeah. Uh, and it, gets, you know, it can get yeah. tedious, even though we do every single component. Uh, but the frames are, you know, a, a challenge mm. to, to make them fast enough. And yeah. So I noticed a lot of the competitors, one of the things I heard people complain about was you needed two hands to engage the rack. Mm -hmm. You guys have always had, as far as I know, a one hand operation. What's, what's the difference? How People are probably wondering how you guys don't have to have the two hand. Well, someday we may have to. And have to come up with something like that. Most of the competitors that have that, the people I've talked to, they tend to disengage it right. pretty quick, which you know they shouldn't do. But my feelings on it is that I've never heard of an accident with this machine or any other log splitter that didn't involve two people. Mm. When you have the two hands of the operator busy, it really encourages them to get a helper, load it, because this machine's fast and that's its you know, main selling point and claim the bank. Mm. So I think it's more dangerous with a two-hand operation, yep. human nature being what it is, you know, if you do by the book, but you know, people buy this to split wood because they're selling it. So that's right. how they can do it. Yeah, I know I have a video out, uh, a friend of mine has a wood you know, business, he does full tree service, but he does firewood as a side thing. He sells about 2,000 cords a year. He has two super splits and a uh, CRD processor. He actually had a timber wolf, I think it was a TW5 or a TW6, and he sold it. Hmm. He said that the super splits were faster and they were a lot simpler, easier to work on. So he ended up selling the timber wolf. Hmm. Yeah, well, the timber wolf's a, a really good machine. And I've got a couple of my customers that have both because you can block it has, up has the big stuff. Yeah. 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 Uh, but they're, they're also pretty darn pricey. Yeah, it's that's yeah, it's good. Uh, all hydraulics, you know, you're getting what you pay for. You probably three you, times the price of yeah, this comparable super split as far as how many cords you could do an hour. Yeah, we have to get a large quantity over the powder coat mm -hmm. to keep the cost down. And again, you know, quantity make, making them fast enough is, is the biggest struggle we have. Yeah. So uh, we'll do a little bit of both, like these are powder coated, tables are powder coated, but I have to have 44 tables. The whack to go over the power. And that changed recently, you said. Yeah. So now you're yeah, going to change how you do your production. Yeah. Well, because uh, the cost, everything's going to the roof. Yeah. There was a point at one point where he couldn't even get the red powder. Everything we buy, we have to buy twice as much as we used to. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you need twice as much storage space and mm -hmm. twice as much upfront cost. And yeah. so it sounds like before it was kind of a buy order. You kind of build them to uh, order. Yeah, well, you know, you could. If you needed something, you could get it within three days. Yeah. You know, we have, we've had vendors we've been working with for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, the tires that we are waiting for, we bought those two from uh, another supplier. We haven't touched them, but just to have them. Because our main supplier of tires, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're sitting on a boat off the coast. Yeah. Now, as far as other options, what are some of the other options people can get on these machines? We've got a tow hitch that bolts to the bottom of the front foot. Mm -hmm. You can get an inch and seven eighths or a two inch coupler on it. Um, we came up with that method, actually a customer did, because he had a, like a John Deere lawn tractor. So mm -hmm. his ball was very low to the ground. So by having the hitch on the ground, uh, you know, you can tow it with just about anything. So mm -hmm. it works, but uh, when you're splitting wood, it's gonna come down and land on the tow hitch, if you just let it pile up, uh, mm -hmm. and then you drag the machine out from under it. Most people are dealing with the wood as they split it, though. So, yeah. You know, people, they sell, they, they like them. Mm -hmm. A lot of people would like to have a adjustable height. Uh, then you're gonna scratch your leg up, you mm -hmm. can slide it, and plus it's just a lot more expensive mm -hmm. arrangement to make, so trying to keep the cost down there. Mm -hmm. So the tow hitch is one. The extra wide table, which we do not have because uh, but a, uh, 12 week lead time with that supplier. And those are? They're all locally made. But are those kind of one piece like that or are those more? Yeah, three pieces. And we came up with that because we have experimented with a lot of different shipping methods. And uh, we actually use the table as the sides of the crate and put the machine in to protect it mm -hmm. during the travel. And uh, it worked okay. But then we stumbled across this method of actually tilting the machine up on its tail on a 
regular pallet, and we're able to get it on a 40 by 48 inch pallet, which has really helped in the cost of shipping. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, it's on wheels then. Uh, before the wheels and axle were separate, you know, there's a lot more assembly mm -hmm. when you got it before. Now it's a uh, question yeah. of putting the engine on and the table. Yeah. And that's about it. So that helps on the uh, receiving end. What do you think is the furthest you've shipped one of these machines? You don't go overseas, but years ago we first started doing it. I shipped one to Kuwait. <laughs> you don't go overseas? No, just because of the you know the regulations, and then you know if there's a, a warranty issue, which we don't have warranty issues, but if you do, you know, and you have to take care of it overseas, mm -hmm. you, so you have to set up. So if someone from another country did want one of these machines, and kind of wouldn't have an option. No, I think some guys have had people buy them here, and then they might get them over there because people have called from overseas. Uh, looking for parts yep. occasionally, yep. but uh, that's you know. And we, we, I talked to a guy in England about it. He wanted to sell them over there, and you know we looked into it, but we're having trouble keeping up with sales here. Yeah. So we have to uh, change the way we do things. Uh, so it's, yeah. So you had, so there's no super split dealers per se. It's just all directly a, from you to the customer. Pretty much. There's a couple of them from you know the old days when there were a lot of dealers before the internet. They all pretty much died on the vine, but a couple of them kept doing it, so that's great. We, we work with them. Uh, there is a outfit in California though has, that wanted to become a dealer, so I would say yeah, you can if you want, but you know it's not our main marketing right. method. Uh, but they've been very diligent in marketing it, and uh, they're doing a great job, and they're ordering a lot of machines. Mm -hmm. Oregon Woodlot. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a co-op. Oregon uh, with a lot of co-op I think mm -hmm. and so it's been good but they order you know eight twelve machines at a whack and so that is a chunk for us to get out all at once so right